So, hello and welcome to everybody around the world. My name is Rebecca Caro and I run Row Perfect. Row Perfect is the premier rowing education website and we're very pleased today to be running our very first expert chat with a group of panelists who've all come together as a result of an ebook that we published by Jim Flood, a manifesto to improve club rowing for beginners. This discussion today is about beginner rowing and how clubs can improve the experience they offer to prospective members. With me today, I have a fantastic group of experts from around the world, from Australia, Ron Batt, from America, Bruce Smith, and of course from Great Britain, Jim Flood. Guys, would you introduce yourselves to the audience? Ron. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, so I, I moved over to Australia uh, 20 years ago now. Um, I work for Rowing Australia, looking after coach education, rowing participation programs, and uh, I also run illicit drugs in sport presentations. Um, part of my I, in the past, I run rowing clubs as a head coach. I'm still um, a member of my original club back in the UK. Um, I also. Um, have been involved in institutes and coaching at the elite level as well as at club level. So I've had a good range. Very passionate about what happens in the clubs. Uh, at the moment, I'm at an airport because I've got to go and visit one of the, a couple of clubs down in the south of Australia this week. Um, and um, yeah, very passionate about the whole sort of keeping the clubs thriving because we need them. Great. So, Bruce. Uh, hi. Yeah, my name is Bruce Smith, and uh, I live in Boston, but I'm actually Canadian. And I work at Community Rowing, uh, which is a club in Boston. We serve about 1,200 people every day, and we're really in the business of teaching people how to row. Um, we, we don't serve rowers. We serve non-rowers, and we teach them how to row. And I, I coach a lot myself. I coach uh, at the development level and at the, at the elite level, but uh, we have about 70 uh, full and part-time coaches who are who are working at CRI through the season and uh, spend a lot of time with uh, people who know absolutely nothing about our sport. Great. And Jim? Well, that's uh, an interesting start already, Rebecca. Hello, everyone. My name's Jim Flood. I live in uh, the UK in Reading, and I'm a member of Reading Rowing Club, where I'm involved in uh, teaching beginners to row and uh, seeing how they develop. I also work as a coach educator for British Rowing and for FISA, where I do some work uh, mainly in African countries, but I've also done some work in South America as well, mainly around the organization of rowing and uh, developing it as a, as a sport. Fantastic. So after Jim gave us the manuscript for his book, which we published, I sent it round to a few people who I know internationally, and we published it, and it has had hundreds of downloads. And one of the bits of feedback I received from people in different parts of the world was that they were seeing this exact problem in their part of the world. And that gave me the inspiration to try and open this up to an international discussion, because a rowing club in Canada, a rowing club in Australia, New Zealand, are often facing similar challenges. None of us are in conflict with each other because we're not, apart from feeding the international team with aspiring athletes, we do the grunt work of finding new people and recruiting them to the sport and keeping the sport alive at the community level. And so by sharing our ideas, I hope that we can all help each other. Jim, can you kick off by telling everyone what, your, what motivated you to write the ebook in the first place? Oh, um, I think the motivation was to stir things up, Rebecca. Um, I did regard it as very heretical, really. Um, but uh, to be a bit more serious, um, I, I read an interesting article recently by an American economist who was asked why there was a lack of entrepreneurship generally in a lot of uh, Western European countries. And uh, he said it wasn't about finance, um, and it wasn't about education. 
it was a lack of curiosity. Now, that struck a chord with me because I just get the feeling that many people who are teaching beginners to row just lack curiosity. They lack curiosity about teaching and learning and about the process and about the mechanics of rowing. They just do it as if they were following a formula which they've never examined and has worked for them for a long time and they see no reason to change it. So I really wanted to stir things up a little bit. Um, so that, that was the motivation. That was a great one. And I suspect that many of us came to rowing being taught how to row by people who were teaching us in the exact same way that we were taught. And in fact, someone shared a great video online this week filmed in Britain on the Thames in, I'm guessing, the early 1980s. And there's a coach there who is filmed saying, come along, don't act like a load of suet puddings and act like you're a limbo, nimble, agile athlete, not like a bunch of people who can't do anything else, which is why you're rowing, which is, apart from being a bit demeaning, perhaps the way that many of us were taught to row. So my first question is about coaching methods. To what extent have coaching methods changed over the last few years? Particularly with regard to being prescriptive, moving from being prescriptive, which is telling people what to do, to consultative. Are there any su successful exceptions? Jim? I think they are. Um, I assess coaches for their qualifications and I come across some exceptionally good uh, practitioners in that respect. Um, people who, first of all, will respond to what's happening uh, with the athlete or with the crew in a way which is very interactive. That, that's one thing. And I, I state that because not all coaches seem to be responding. They seem to have a a set script which they run through. Um, it's almost regardless of what is happening. Um, and they have a set of mantras which they keep repeating. Uh, so first of all, yes, I do see coaches who have that sensitivity and who are watching and listening and responding and then asking, asking questions. So yes, I do see that. but. It is the exception rather than the rule. And I just get the feeling that these people would be um, would be working that way, regardless, because that's part of their personality rather than as a result of training. So, Ron, what's the Australian experience here? I think um, <clears throat> you know, the communication side is, is a crucial part of coaching and, and how we engage with people is is, is um, really important. I've, um, yeah, my experience traveling around, I, I get out on the water with a lot of different coaches and certainly we have those out there who are a bit too prescriptive for my um, personal, uh, um, my personal take on it. I, I think it's, it's logical that the more consultative we are with people, the more you're likely to engage with them, the better you're likely to engage with them, I think. Um, and, I, and I think also there's an element, although having said that, there is an element of um, the age group you're, you're dealing with. You know, if you're dealing with very, very young, um, you know, youngsters at school and so on, it, it may well be that you have to be a bit more prescriptive. Um, but overall, you know, I think we are, we, are, we are moving more towards being more consultative than prescriptive. Um, and a bit of a mix of both doesn't go astray. You know, I've, I've been fortunate... Um, with some of the clubs I've been at, you know, one particular club where we had a lot of um, a lot of youngsters, and they gelled into a really good group by giving them more ownership and of, of what was going on. Um, it was still very much led by me as the head coach and the other coaches, but they they grew, they benefited from being more consulted than I would have done in the past, as I guess as I developed as a coach. And, and I think sometimes as coaches, we, we tend to sort of want to be the, uh, I hesitate to, the words you, to, I hesitate to use the word guru, but we want to be the one that knows it all. Whereas in fact, I think the smart coaches are the ones that say, well, I don't know it all, you know, and 
talking to the athlete about how they're feeling that day before we do the work um, can help them, you know, can help the coach understand what, what position they're in physically and mentally and, and and just how hard you want to push them on that particular day as well. Okay. Does that Bruce, make sense? Bruce, you coach coaches, don't you, as well as coaching athletes? Yeah, we have uh, a really fun program. Uh, it's based at something called the Institute for Rowing Leadership. We started uh, five years ago and it's a, it's a year-long master's level education program for coaches and they take about 20 hours of uh, classroom work every week and then they're coaching about 20 hours every week. So we have a fun laboratory and um, We've put them to work. We've put our, our students to work on how to teach people how to row faster, not not how to teach people how to go faster in the water, but how to teach them more quickly so that they enjoy the sport. Um, and one of the big things that we've discovered, uh, well, first of all, uh, low different expectations for people who are arriving, and have uh, fun as soon as possible. And what that usually means is play games and. Um, we try and play games with the kids that we get, and so we have a lot of kids who are, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13 down for the first time, and rather than try and teach them the basics uh, so that they do those things perfectly and establish a good pattern, we say, have at it and go chase that soccer ball out on the water, and uh, that really, that grips the kids in a way that being told, you know, uh, don't open your back or use your arms this way um, doesn't so that's that's sort of our, our big takeaway the past couple of years is play more games and have more fun. That's very interesting because we actually have an ebook on the shop that's called Games and Challenges for Young Rowers, which yeah. came from someone in New Zealand. Very much the same experience. Yeah. Now, when you're coaching coaches, Bruce, what are you instructing them in terms of um, overcoming the situation Jim described? of a prescriptive coaching technique that does not adapt to what is happening with the athletes in front of them? Yeah, I think, I don't know of any really good coaches who do that anymore. Um, we don't keep them around our place and if somebody's there to tell people what to do, uh, we don't see them as, as really coaches. Our coaches are all, we, we intend for them to be service people and teachers and uh, really care for people and um, and so there's not a lot of there's not a lot of telling people what to do at all. Uh, and if it's uh, if it's got to be learned, then we try and uh, put it into a game and hit as many different formats as we can. So we show and and uh, you know also use auditory signals and uh, any kind of uh, tactile stuff that we can do, and really try and combine all of those multiple intelligences together in one lesson plan so that uh, coaches can, can reach as many people as they as possible. So you've mentioned lesson plans. Anyone got any experience with actually using these as opposed to talking about them? Bruce, I'd like to hear you talk a little bit more. I'm absolutely fascinated by the uh, coach education program and I'm also fascinated by the idea of introducing rowing through games and um, uh, getting people absorbed uh, in, in the activities. Could you give us a few more examples um, of, of, of how you would start off and how a group would be taken through the early stages um, of joining you with the intention of learning to row? Yeah, it, it divides into two or three different categories. Um, the, a good example is uh, when kids come down and we want them to sit on the rowing machine and uh, row with uh, good rhythm and not just zip around. Um, we have them all scream out at the top of their lungs, uh, pineapple on the recovery and chunk on the drive. And they think, for some reason, they think that's hilarious. And uh, it really works well, though, that you can get a group of 60 kids uh, who are, you know, 11 years old with no attention span whatsoever uh, to, to scream pineapple chunk and row with excellent rhythm. And so it's really, um, it's a lot of creativity on the part of the coaches and 
those games extend and extend and extend, and we try and capture them all in things that we call KSAs, uh, Knowledge, Skills, and Abilities. And we have the, the bare bones KSAs available on a website that uh, you can look at, actually. It's uh, CRICoach.com. And that has, uh, that has lesson plans for all, all of the stuff we do. On the adult side, um, we use pontoons on, on eights, and we lower our expectations and get them rowing all eight as quickly as we can, which is sort of, I've, I've heard a lot of people say that, and it's, it's, um, it's not uncommon for us to have a team building exercise with 100 grown-ups come down. Uh, they arrive at 2 p.m. They're on the water at 2.20. They've learned how to race by 2.50, and we've decided who the winner is by 3.30. And they're in the bar. And, and then they go off. No, and they go off in the world, and they call themselves rowers. And, of course, they're not rowers by any standard that you or I would agree on, but they, they have been in a boat, and they have raced down a race course, and they did get a medal, and uh, they have a, have a wonderful time. And um, a lot of those people come back and, and uh, stay with us, but it's more about, with us, it's a little bit more about volume and less about quality, I guess. So the pontoons on the eight, how many and under which rigors? Uh, under five and six, uh, two of them. And they're the same pontoons that uh, adaptive rowers use. Yep, yep. No, worries. no worries. So we have a question, have a question. about beginner rowers learning to row defensively in reaction to the set and motion of the boat. Is there a way to prevent this? and maintain better techniques. So obviously pontoons is one really good example. Any others? I think um, is Ron here, just um, skimming, you know, skimming the blades on top of the water on the recovery um, is a good way of getting them to understand the hand heights and, and actually just get the balance. And we were doing that the other week down in rural Victoria with, a, with some youngsters which worked really well. Yeah, they actually get a better understanding. This was in sculling boats uh, in, a, in a couple of quads which were struggling a bit. Um, and and that's, that's, I think that's a good way just to give that inbuilt balance. And they pick it up pretty quickly, just skimming the spoons on the recovery. Very nice. I, I personally like rowing in sixes. Sixes is enough of a challenge um, and maybe only 20 strokes before you cycle through the sixes. Mm. I, I would certainly endorse Ron's uh, policy of skimming the water. Um, it is seen to be a bad practice, I think, in, by many coaches in the UK. But it does keep the boat stable and it does get the idea of moving the blade handle parallel to the water, which is so important in keeping, keeping the balance once the blades start to come off the water and it it avoids the, the I like this idea of uh, defensive actions against the the boat uh, because that is um, a cause of tension fear um, and uh, and often lurching around yeah. as well so moving on then from the really, really beginning, someone has asked, how can beginner rowers enjoy racing if they're not that good yet? I think the answer is they all enjoy racing, but perhaps I'm in the minority. <laughs> I, I, well, um, I, I would say two things. One is make the races quite short so that the, you don't have this sort of uh, eight length gap which you sometimes get between finishers, and I was seeing that yesterday at a regatta in the UK. Uh, and also have some fun events, um, uh, slalom races, racing round a boy, um, seeing how many, uh, how quickly, or how many turns you can do in a, a minute. That's turning the boat round in a minute. Um, rigger dips, things like that. So actually thinking of instead of racing seeing it as a form of mini fun competitions. Yeah, yeah, totally with you on that, Bruce. I think um, yeah, the um, one of the things that I, I like doing is, is with with um, not for, yeah with people who are very very much starting out is having little tag races around a boy um, in teams. That's great. I like any sort of challenge. I was teaching adult beginners and they're in play boats. And I just said, right, now let's see if, if you can row to that boy, come round it and come back. And it wasn't a race. It was each individual. 
but it was a challenge and I feel that challenges are perhaps a more constructive word to use than races because most of them treat the challenge with respect and try hard and actually that's all you need to learn to start racing in my view. I, I like the idea of challenges and I also like the idea of setting them things to try and solve for themselves. Um, quite typically once they've started, and, and this would be perhaps in a training sculling boat, uh, start them off just rowing with one hand, then the other hand, um, then some confidence building drills, then perhaps two hands. Um, and once they've rowed a little bit, I ask them to see if they can find reverse gear and just let them experiment. And it's surprising how quickly many of them sort it out. And if they have sorted out for themselves, their understanding and their learning is, is so much better. Bruce, you must have examples of this. Setting, solving problems for yourself. Tell us more about the soccer ball on the water. Um, our, my favorite thing to do from my office is to watch uh, the middle schoolers who have come down to the water for the first time race in uh, barges. And uh, we don't, do you guys know what barges are? I'm sure you do. They're, uh, you know, large craft. But we actually, we try and rename them racing catamarans. Mm -hmm. So they have uh, usually 12 seats with an aisle down the middle. And uh, they're very stable and uh, have a very adjustable rigor and very adjustable feet. Uh, so that they can be, uh, they, they actually work well for people of all shapes and sizes. And to watch two or three barges racing up and down in, fr in front of my uh, office window is really uh, great fun, and the kids just go wild. So they really have a great time with that. And I will say adults do that too. I mainly teach adult beginners, and yeah. once they have overcome the classic adult problem, which is that I do not wish to appear foolish, they actually really enjoy a challenge and a challenge that can be, as Jim said, as simple as can you get from A to B in the fewest number of strokes, yeah. not necessarily a race. Right. I'm a big fan of that short race idea too because it just it makes things much more interesting. You can do it several times. It's, uh, it's really good fun. That's awesome. Anyone else got any recommendations? So moving on to a second group of questions which is all about integration and how people migrate from turning up and never having sat in a rowing boat before to moving through different groups and the question here is about how do you retain people who want to scull when sculling is less group orientated than sweep? Well I'll make a start on that. Rebecca, because uh, part of it is a, a, a safety management. <coughs> uh, you can have um, safe sculling boats with pontoons and you can keep them uh, reasonably close and you can, you can follow them with a launch, but at some point you have to decide when uh, they can go a little bit further on their own because that's what they want to do. Now, um, I've tried to instigate a, a sort of a driving license uh, kind of test so that people can then be licensed to row within say 250 meters of the of the club um, then they can row a little bit further um, and they can only row with a, a buddy at the same time so uh, partly it's a structural thing and partly it's to do with safety and risk management so that's one aspect of it now, I'd like to hear um, other people's views on that. <clears throat> yeah, we have um, we have a uh, we have a kind of a complicated. I, I don't know if it's complicated. We have a system. Uh, people start in wider boats and move to narrower boats, and there are a series of four classes that take about a year to go through, and we just call them sculling one, two, three, and four. So you start in a wide boat, you go to a slightly narrower boat, you go into doubles and quads for sculling three, and then by sculling four, you're ready for a racing single. And then at the end of sculling four, the theory is that you're capable of passing a captain's test. And the captain's test involves a series of skills, uh, rowing on the square, 
and there's a written component. You have to know the rules of the river. You have to understand which bridges are uh, appropriate to go through and which which have to be avoided, and so on and so forth. And once you pass all of those um, all of those requirements, then we issue you a, a login so you can take a boat out any time on your own. But you have to be over uh, over 18 years old, and you have to be able to pass this fairly fairly challenging test. And um, each of the sculling classes is about six weeks long, and uh, each one has its own knowledge, skills, and abilities uh, material. And it, it actually it works pretty well overall. Not a bad system. That sounds amazing and really beautifully structured. Can you retake the class, Bruce, if you aren't ready to graduate? Yeah, we have yeah. lots of classes, especially if they like to the, like the retake a class. Uh, sometimes yeah, they'll retake all So, any other ideas? Um, just a question, Rebecca. Um, the, the investment in, say, rowing barges and uh, a range of boats of various widths is quite considerable. And I certainly think that UK clubs generally will, are very resistant to that kind of investment. I know in my own club it was a huge struggle. Uh, to uh, to get agreement to buy uh, training boats with pontoons and some wide boats as well for, for, for teaching rowing. Now, since then, they have seen the benefit, but it's still quite tough. It's not seen to be a high priority, particularly when the top squad want a new eight. Correct. Husband, when, for example. When storage is a full of mouth, there isn't much space. You guys know about the Raptor Balance, which is a 300 pound strap on of pontoon that goes over a fine or fine double. No, that's news to me. Can you explain a little bit more about it? It's sold commercially by an Irish man. And um, it is exactly what it is, the plastic sleeve goes around the canvas, onto which you bolt a set of pontoons. And you can you know, raise and lower them so that, like trainer wheels, you get more of a tip or less tip on the boat. And you can then just remove them. They fit on any standard single or double or pair. Well, that's brilliant. Great. I'll circulate the URL. Yeah. But they're cheap. I and mean, as Jim says, if you're talking three hundred pounds versus three thousand pounds, it's an investment. The other solution I've seen is regional rowing clubs coming together to buy launch rowboats. So where I live, we can get twelve of them, and they come on a trailer, and you just go to the local rowing association and says, "Can we book them?" And your job is just to pick them up, look after them, maintain them, and then return the next time to borrow them. So they're commonly owned. Mm. That's an excellent idea, uh, yeah, Rebecca. Yeah. Mm. We're getting a lot of echo from somebody. Mm. Anyone mm. conscious that it's coming from them? No worries. No worries. So moving on, how do you even begin a racing group? Ron, do you have experience? Sorry, Rebecca, can you repeat the question? How do you integrate a beginner in racing? Again, I think it comes back to what we were talking about earlier, just making sure that the racing we're going to do with them is, is suitable for the level they're at. Um, you know, I, I don't think there's a lot of point in getting them doing 2,000 metres um, too early, uh, not to put too fine a point on it, or, or 1,000. Yeah, it's better to, to make sure that they don't get um, um, put off um, by being put into an event that's that's unsuitable for them, but I think you know most people are competitive, and, and you know a lot or a lot of people that take the sport up are wanting to be competitive, and we and we need to um, make sure that they can um, enjoy their um, competitive instincts. Um, so again, it's trying to find suitable events for them, and whether that's something that's put on by the club or getting a few clubs together to do that, or a few schools together, um, just just to um, keep them. 
enthusiastically. Um, okay, Ron. Let me change the, the question slightly. How do you integrate beginners into a group that are more advanced skill level rather than racing? Okay. Well, well, I think again, I think I think actually just um, well, my experience was I, I was fortunate. I was put in with somebody who was who'd been rowing for a few years longer than me and um, that way you learn a lot quicker so I think it's a case of just just picking um, the right people to mix them with I, I actually think you know all clubs should be um, telling their members that well actually you know part of your membership is that you know we'll expect you to, to do this to to go out with um, the novices uh, that are joining the club because it's it's a really crucial stage once people have done the learn to row course how, how you actually take them to that next level to, to integrate them fully into the club. And I think that's where the club members need to take some ownership. To build the club, you need to actually put something back in. You can't just pay your fees and turn up. You need to be prepared to come out and get on the water with some of these folks that are just learning. So it's a case of you know, mixing people around and saying, well, you know, once a month or once every couple of months, depending on how often you're, you're bringing novices through, you'll be expected to go out for a row with, with these novices. And, and I was down in Nara at the weekend, and they're doing a great job of that in, in rural South New South Wales, where that's exactly one of the things they've been decided doing, and they find it works really well. It just makes that person that's done the Learn to Row course feel they, they, they get to know the people in the club a bit better, going out in the water with them. And, it, and crucially, they also start learning some skills very quickly, you know, improving their skill level. Bruce, what's your experience? Because you have a very, very diverse group of people coming yeah. through your club and volume, which the rest of us don't quite have in the same scale. Yeah, the, uh, it offers uh, some opportunities and some challenges. So we have a series of courses um, that are really uh, designed to bring people along. So similar to Sculling 1, 2, 3, and 4, after you've completed Sculling 4, you're ready to join a group of people who train on a regular basis and some of them compete. On the sweep side for adults, uh, we have um, a similar series of courses and there's a progression from uh, something we call General Sweeps 2, which is just a terrible and inspiring name. Uh, but they, uh, they move on from there, if they're, in, if they're interested, they move on from there to the competitive team. And uh, the competitive team is you know, a lot higher level commitment, and uh, we we turn people away on the competitive side. So there's a there's a tryout process, and um, you know, and we have our national team development group, and that's tiny. That's just a few people, uh, but that's fed and supported sort of by the general community. And on the youth side, it's the same kind of progression. So kids start with a, a six week course, and then they move on to a year long novice commitment, and if they like it, they, they stay with us, and, it, and we have probably 400 kids who compete at a pretty high level, um, and probably six or out of the six or 700 kids who come down every day, uh, probably, I would say, like 400 compete. And the, the kids who compete have the best time. They, they put more in, and they get more out. And the recreational kids, it's more like their parents might want them to try it, or they might get dropped off because their parents don't want to see them till 5 o'clock, or something like that. So it's, you know, the, the groups, uh, we have a, a clear progression of courses and, um, and that works pretty well and it's because we have enough size to do that. The, the perpetual issue is that nobody wants to row somebody who's not as fast as they believe themselves to be. And so uh, being, a, being a large club doesn't solve that problem, it just makes it sort of less obvious, I think. Do you introduce people to sweep first or sculling? We would prefer to do sculling, but uh, we, we do we can choose either one with us. And uh, on the on the very young side, we stick to sculling. So if you're under age 11, uh, you have to scull. But even that, we would prefer to keep kids sculling until they were 15 or 16. And we're building. Uh, we hope to build a, a new facility or two uh, where we'll where we'll start kids younger, and they'll only scull until they're ready to uh, twist their backs a little bit more. Fantastic. That's great, a great way to go. I have um, a little insight to echo Ron's experience in terms of the integration of beginners into a, a regular training group. And my club runs what we call a jamming session on Saturday in the same way that a band members will all turn up and jam together with no fixed idea of what songs they're going to play. Um, that's exactly what we do. You just show up, there are no fixed crews and one appointed person picks out crews on the day in the boat shed um, at 7 o'clock on a Saturday morning and everyone agrees that they will row with whoever they are put with and not complain and that is 
a condition of our membership and uh, we try our best to give everybody a good time because we, like you, realize that not only does it get people to know other people, it also accelerates their learning. Jim, sorry, Jeremy, Jim, hold on, uh, Jeremy just needs to unmute you. Sorry, Jim, I'm not hearing you. You're muted. Ha. While Jim's just sorting that out. Um, okay, is that, uh, is that sorted that out? Yep. Okay, yep. okay I'll start again. Um, I, I, I want to endorse very much what you say about this um, mixing because uh, part of a person's um, sort of sense of identity with a club comes from through the social dimension and as you mentioned mixing and getting to know people is so important and actually getting a feel of what it's like to row uh, with experienced rowers is also a key part in seeing how they what they can work towards I only wish UK clubs would actually take this up because in my experience very very few of them actually do We've tried it a couple of times in my own club, but it starts to fall apart very, very quickly. I, I would like to see a stronger lead taken by British rowing in terms of um, policy on this matter. That's interesting. That's interesting. I think one of the ways it way can be overcome by part of your membership so that you sign up to join the club and the club, quite a lot of clubs say, you have to do bar duty once a year or you're expected to get involved with fundraising. Uh, that possibly this could be one of the conditions that could be added to club membership. Bruce, do you do anything in this regard? We have uh, specific volunteer requirements and we do a lot of team building activities. Um, there are so many people, it's sort of, uh, it's a little bit daunting uh, to introduce everybody to everybody else. Um, but it's really, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit past us in terms of getting everybody to volunteer. So it's, it's sort of specific groups and we track it and it's on the honor system. And so people come down and they spend uh, 12 hours a year and they have to do groundskeeping and bits and pieces like that. And it, it's it's not because we want them to do groundskeeping. They do a terrible job and we have to do it over again, usually. <laughs> but it's so that they, um, so that they, uh, they get to know each other and, and feel some sense of connection and responsibility. And do you know, Ron and I were in the same club and this happened uh, when we were there. The club offered tea, coffee and toast in between outings on a Saturday and Sunday morning. And the best team building activity we offered uh, was that broke down the barriers between the different training groups was to obligate each group to run the kitchen once a right. month. Exactly. And so you had to stand at the counter and say, hello, I would <laughs> like a cup of tea and two slices of toast and have yep. a dialogue with someone you've never spoken with before. And all right. the grumpy old men were the best. <laughs> right. That's exactly right. So we, uh, we do that kind of work and it's, it's super, super effective. You, you might lie to it, Rebecca, but I mean, it was actually really effective, wasn't it, in getting yeah. people to know the new, yeah, you know, the new members and the members getting them to know the current members. It's, yeah. it's a great way, and I think that's so important when you get um, people taking the sport up. Um, we're about to uh, take off in a moment, so I'm probably going to have to. Well, I am. I'm going to have to say goodbye. Um, thank you very much. Thoroughly enjoyed it, and um, really, really good to hear the comments from um, Bruce, Jim. And, and yourself, and um, yeah, take care. Thanks for your entertainment, but also your great insight and expertise, Ron. We really value it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Ron. thanks very much. Take care. Bye bye. Moving on then from this idea of someone being a beginner and moving into being a squad member, do you, you have any tips about how to retain squad members, say, three to six months into? Uh, an athlete's membership of a regular training group? Um, our issue is a little bit more 
how to uh, get rid of them. Um, because, uh, you know, we, we want to teach lots of people how to row, and, and when things pile up uh, in terms of having so many people around, it gets a little bit awkward, and so um, our, our biggest issue is just capacity, I think. Jim, do you have any particular uh, progression pathways that you've seen work effectively? Uh. I'm really struggling to, uh, you know, think of of, of examples uh, in this respect, because the attrition rate from learn to row courses is just incredibly high. Um, I, I think it's as it's as often as high as 95 percent. In other words, you know, out of 100 people who do learn to row courses, about we might get five in the club after six months and talking around that's not unusual and it's pretty pretty abysmal. Now one uh, one idea that I tried and I thought was reasonably successful is to have someone in the squad who has a direct responsibility for looking after the interests of uh, newcomers to that squad and that role can change. Um, when people went to college years ago, they often um, arrived in the first year and they were allocated an auntie or an uncle um, who had been at the college before and just looked after their interests and saw them you know, through the first stages. And I think that idea is, is quite a good one. But seeing it someone who is who is going to advocate for their interests, I, mean, I often come across the syndrome of the newcomer who doesn't quite make it into the boat that day and has to sit on the erg and the next time and the next time and the next time and after coming down about five or six times and not getting a row and just being told to sit on an erg on their own uh, I'm not surprised that they don't come back a seventh time. I've seen a solution in New Zealand when they take on a, a group for their first year of training and they call them novices, but they take them on in crews. So they will take on eight people, and those eight people all have to show up every week because they know that the seven others are relying on them and that they will stick it through until the national championships. Now, they start this probably five months before the national championships. So that's the beginning day one of learning to row. So it's a, a length of time, but not an unduly long length of time but it does have an obligation to stick it through. Looks like we've lost Bruce somewhere on the call. Jim's talking. Jim, you need to remember to unmute yourself. Yeah, I, I think this is really a, a, a key point. Uh, and if we look back to the early conversation about coaches being able to respond to the needs of the, the particular crew individuals um, in front of them, coaches really need to be aware of how anxious even adult newcomers are, whether that's new to a learn to row course or new to a squad. And they're often uh, they often look miserable because they're, they're, they're nervous. And I think you know, awareness of the importance of being sensitive um, to, to how they're feeling and to, to make some allowance for that. That sounds Sorry. eminently sensible. Now, we've now, got a new question here, which is about how you can meet the different objectives of members in a small group. So how do you manage to integrate recreational rowers versus ones who want to compete and race versus ones who want just general fitness? Do you have any advice, Jim, on that particular area? Well, yes. I, I want to speak generally about um, objectives first because uh, I, I find in assessing coaches that if they make the objectives uh, clear, 
they tend to list them and they don't explain why the objectives need to be achieved. So they will outline the, the, the session plan, giving the objectives, but not the reasons why they're doing particular things. And it's so important, uh, and I, I'm going to talk generally about learners now, for a learner at the beginning of the session to have a look at the, to have a feel for the learning landscape. What's going to happen? How is it going to happen? What is expected of me? So being clear about the objectives and the means by which they'll be achieved and, and what will constitute success, I think is critically important. Now, um, the objectives can be broad so that uh, people being integrated into the, into the group might not be expected to have the same outcome but they will achieve to a certain degree and I think that needs to be explained as well so that um, there's a sense that you uh, you, you personalize uh, the objectives and you have permission and indeed encouragement to do so. That sounds that eminently sounds sensible. sensible. <coughs> <coughs> At school, At school do you think it's appropriate to have a parallel recreational and competitive racing program. Jim, is this something that you've seen set up successfully? No, I, I, I'm not involved with schools very much, but I, I, I can't help feeling that the idea of um, recreational rowing, and it's, I think it's the, it's almost a non it's it's not a term I actually like. Um, it just seems to have negative connotations, especially rowing in the world of rowing. Um, you know, it's subtext. It's rowing for wimps. Um, so <laughs> I, I think if we see it as non-competitive rowing or rowing for fitness, um, I think we need a different. And it needs better marketing, and that's your area of expertise, um, Rebecca. I think you need to be working on that one. How to market it better. <laughs> When you, when you seek an atmosphere of um, friendliness between the different training groups inside a club and you recognize that your club needs to make some changes, do you think the atmosphere needs to be pushed through by the coaches or should it be led by the club committee or management? Uh, I think it depends on the structure of the, the club. Um, and I... I Clubs have various structures now. It's quite common to have a director of rowing or a head coach. Uh, and generally, I think the committee needs to agree the policy, and then it needs to have clear lines of management about how that policy is delivered, whether it's a jamming session, uh, whether it's a uh, policy for integrating uh, um, people from learn to row courses into a development squad, or from the development squad into the into the racing crews. So I, I think there needs to be a very clear narrative which people understand when they join a club about the journey that they can go on and also the, the, the paths that they can take off, i.e. into non-competitive fitness rowing. I'm not going to use the term recreational rowing. Um, or there can be a, a lesser form of competition, groups that are only going to uh, go to local regattas and they're not going to the big regattas, the big prestigious regattas. So I think to have a very clear pattern of options about what kind of uh, journey you can undertake um, in terms of developing as a rower is, is absolutely vital. So to help, help, to help anyone who's struggling with that, there is an ebook on Row Perfect called How to Set the Strategy for Your Rowing Club, um, which sets out the steps that you need to take um, and explains ways that uh, a committee of management or a head coach can set that in place. But uh, like Jim, I fully endorse having it written down and published very publicly uh, on the notice board um, and available to all new members. 
I have a very nice question here which is also um, a big challenge about how your novices, beginners, can help with club fundraising. This person's club uses bingo as their principal fundraising activity. Do you have any views on this? Um, I hope Ron's going to come back and uh, give us a benefit of his wisdom fairly, no, fairly soon. <laughs> um, yes, I, I can think of one example here where one club was very resistant to the idea uh, of beginners and um, non-competitive rowers. Uh, but what changed their minds or changed their attitudes was the fundraising capability of this particular group. Uh, and I think from uh, the the so the attitude does, well, if we nurture this group and they're fundraising so well, we'll get our new eight kind of thing. But certainly, uh, I think to get people involved in that kind of activity is one sort of focus for their membership, which is quite important. You know, they achieve not necessarily winning pots at regattas, but they achieve through raising money and buying boats for, the, for, for different uh, squads. So they're making a, being a very, very effective and valued contribution to the club. I would definitely I, echo that. The main thing that um, um, I can offer as resources, there's a website called Space Saver Rowing, which is ssrs.net.au, who every three months does a fundraising ideas for rowing clubs blog post. So there are lots of ideas out there if you're short of ideas on how to do it. Um, I love your example, Jim, about uh, the beginners being a major contributor to club funds. And of course, that gives them leverage. And there are lots of um, places where you can go to find out how to run a Learn to Row course. Um, how to do it at a profit um, is also important. And I think that if the committee is serious about changing these attitudes, having money and deciding where to spend that money based on who has contributed to the fundraising can quite quickly ensure that um, the viewpoint is uh, mitigated. It's such an obvious thing to do, but it seems I, I, I would like to hear people's experience from other countries in particular, but I find it's not common in the UK. Um, the main uh, purpose uh, or the main objective that many clubs have is to win Henley uh, or at least to compete at Henley and the focus is towards that and enormous amounts of energy go into it rather than to grow a very strong base from which you're more likely to get the uh, emergence of a very competitive crew you know, from that broad uh, base both of fundraising and of, of people who have become quite aspirational. All really, really, really good, good points. Point. Just so in wrapping up now, now, Jim, do you have any more points that you wanted to raise? Sorry, yes, I'm back. <laughs> it's, a, it's an obvious one, Rebecca, and really it just comes from fairly uh, good practice in teaching and learning because many of the sessions I observe there is a, a briefing where the, uh, the objectives are given out, uh, the object objectives are explained. I've touched on the importance of the reasons why, in other words what are we going to do, how are we going to do it, why are we doing it and the learners need to understand that and if they do their learning will be so much more effective but then uh, I, I, I like to think of, of a good session rather like um, a television soap because at the beginning of a television soap it says last week on the West Wing <laughs> and then you get the television soap and then it says at the end of it and next week it gives you a little clip so it gives you a little trailer of what's going to happen next so lots of coaches in my experience fail 
to refer to the last session and what they did and how they did it and ask questions around it. You know, what did you, what did you, what did you get out of last week? Can you remember what we did? Um, now, what are your from that? What are your personal objectives for this session? And then in the summary, uh, uh, you know, tie things up. And particularly, um, I get uh, rows to talk to each other to reflect on what they can do better or what they have understood better, rather than me telling them. So they, they talk to each other in pairs, then they talk to me. And I, I, while they're talking to each other, it's an excuse for me to go and have a cup of coffee. But yeah, then yeah. to do the summary and say, right, OK, we've got, what are the objectives then do we need to work on next week? What are we going to be doing next week? How are we going to be doing it? It's that looking back at the beginning, looking forward at the end. So important. It's, it's, well, it's in the way that a television soap, you know, leaves you wanting, leaves you anticipating. That's that's got to be a key key point of selling, sell, you know, selling the product. Selling the ongoing, ongoing, for sure. Yeah. Sure. I would add I one would other. Add one. I don't allow the give any negative feedback in those wrap ups. They have to say something positive, and uh, that I think helps to keep the focus on enthusiasm rather than pushing people down, particularly at the end of the session. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, uh, and I, th there's a very good um, series of uh, videos by US Rowing. Um, and in one of them, uh, one of their top coaches uh, s explains um, what uh, for him was a, a complete revelation when he realized that the people he, were co he was coaching were trying as hard as they could to interpret what he was asking them to do. Um, it wasn't a failing on their part. So if actually they weren't able to do it, it was his fault. And that is such a key uh, attitude to have because Oh, again, I see so many coaches, and it makes me very sad. Um, it's it's rather like watching, um, uh, you know, someone in a foreign country can't then they can't make themselves understood, so they simply shout louder. And it's that syndrome, the you know, coaches who repeat things and just shout louder, even when the athlete, the beginner, is actually trying as hard as they. As they can to get it right to please that person, and you know they're just getting more disapprobation. <laughs> and that, that's not a good thing. That's not a good learning experience. So ending on a positive note, um, I will write a, a quick wrap-up summary onto the uh, Row Perfect blog of the topics we've covered, which have been so fabulously diverse. Uh, I'd like to thank Jim Flood, Bruce Smith and Ron Batt for their considerable expertise and also their generosity in sharing with the rest of us what they themselves know and learn so that club coaches and management committees of rowing clubs and schools and universities around the world can benefit from their experience. We're really, really grateful to all of you for sharing and to you, the listeners, if you have further questions please address them to us through Row Perfect, and we will forward them on to the participants and get you more answers. If you think it's beneficial and you've enjoyed this podcast, please share it, tell other people about it, and send us suggestions of other topics that you'd like us to cover in future episodes. So for now, from me, Rebecca Caro, and the Row Perfect team, Thank you very much for your time, your attention, your enthusiasm, and your questions. Till next time, bye-bye.